Hello, everybody. I will try to keep this very brief. I've got four heads to analyze here, three drawings and one painting. I'm going to focus on major structural issues that not only these artists have struggled with, but that most artists struggle with in their career. So check this out if you draw heads, if you paint heads. I'm going to talk about a lot of issues that um, will help improve your work. Each of these was made in a different style to serve a different purpose. But my critique today, the thing I'm going to focus on is common to all of these pieces. Now, I want to say I actually really like all three of these works. Uh, for example, this one has an amazing sense of acting and pathos in the character's face. And what there are a few decisions here that you would generally advise against, like going this dark in not just your um, local dark values, like with the hair being black in this case, or what looks like mascara, really thick makeup, but also going really dark in your half tones. Generally, I would that's not advisable, but somehow in this situation, it actually it works, I think. And then just saving the the whites for these specular highlights. It's it's a it's a high design kind of a a look, but what where we run into problems that undermine the whole effect, it comes down to structure. And the situation is that the head is a complex three-dimensional form and it is turning in space. And when we look at photography, you also have the added problems that come with uh, working from photos, which are that our eye does not see like a, like a camera does. A camera is not even a particularly good analogy for how we see and the distortions and the way that the camera sees if we are faithful to that reference and draw it the way the photo was it's not, it's not going to look um it's going to look like a photograph when you draw from a photograph it's it's almost always obvious that's what you're doing so there's a lot of challenges that are there but primarily the challenge is just in structure. It's and not even nuances. Like I drill down on a lot of these drawings and these critiques and I really talk about these these ways that we can describe, you know, form every mark being more effective. But today I really want to focus more on sort of the the big structural things. So in this case we've got a upshot. We're looking up at the head. Now how do I know that? Uh, right away. Well, I know that because we're seeing the bottom of the nose. I know that because the mouth is the upper lip is bending more. We're seeing more of that. And the lower lip is squashing down. I know that because of how much of the eye socket we're seeing from below. And I know that because if I look at the relationship of the brows coming back to where the ears are, it's not a straight line. The ear is not ending here. If I come across the nose, the ear is not ending down here. We're actually dropping down. So all of those are clues that we're looking up. And Generally speaking, so it looks like it, it looks like the things that are working that I've just pointed out are working by virtue of the fact that you were accurate or relatively faithful to your photograph. I don't get the sense that this stuff is working because you have a mastery of those concepts. And the difference is that um, if it's if you're if we're getting a lot of these things right because of our reference, then there's going to be areas where we slip up and. Obviously, we're not going to be able to change the design. We're not going to be able to do it from imagination because we're stuck on that reference. So let's let's go through here and look at some of the um, areas that are working and then some areas structurally that, that, need, that need some help. So the first thing is the eyes lie on a horizontal line. And that horizontal line, more or less, is going to line up with all of these features from the front of the face. So if we've got this, this, corners of the mouth, tip of the nose, 
This is called bilateral symmetry, and it's something that um, all animals have. So all of these points need to be able to be to, to align here. And this is this is something that we always start here, but most people know this. Like you probably knew that already. Um, knowing it and then having the discipline to follow it are, are different things. So generally people will, will get a lot of these things correct, but then they're, they're only thinking of, oh, well, the eyes or the mouth or the nose, I got to make sure that's on this construction line. And then they don't also make sure that all the other forms lie on it as well. So in, in our case here, um, we have some problems. One of them is that, you know, these lines that are, that I'm seeing for the nose, I have to make a decision because they're, they're just, they're just not lining up. Now there is also the reality of perspective, and so you could be in a in a situation where you actually want to have these lines lines be converging, which is perfectly okay. Like that's not you'd have to be really close to the head to get anything like that um, in terms of how we would perceive it. But obviously, with photography or with a with a really stylistic approach, you might want to do that. For example, there are a lot of artists right now, uh, illustrators and comics mainly, who are working with um, spherical distortions, panoramas, all kinds of like really interesting perspectives. So there, there could be reasons where you'd want to have convergence, but I'm not seeing the convergence either. So to me, it just looks like uh, you just were not being uh, careful enough. So in the case of the eyes, the other thing that we need to think about, so this is our, let's, let's find our, our center line here. Just drawing the center line can often expose to us problems because even there I had to struggle a little bit because it's not clear what the form's doing there. It's not clear what the form's doing here. There's several areas there where your form's ambiguous. So a good thing about doing the center line is it kind of forces you to have to confront that a little bit. So theoretically here, because it's organic, yes, but because of this bilateral symmetry, there is a there's a mechanical element there. It, to some degree, we can treat it like it's an architecture or it's a vehicle or it's a building, something that is going to be, um, it's going to have more regular rules. Now, in reality, we know that the, the, the eyes are further back on the outer canthi where the, where the lids come together here and they actually come forward, forward, and this is why oftentimes in the Renaissance, you'll see uh, a curve being used here because that curve is going to sort of approximate the fact that this is coming closer, that's further back. This is coming closer, that's further back. So that is a problem I'm seeing with these eyes. These eyes, this eye seems to be going down this way and this eye seems to be going, they're just, they're kind of wonky. So. But before we even get to, to that, the, the bigger issue is where the eyeball is placed. So you probably are, already know this, but we've got one eye distance, and then on average there's another eye distance before the next eye starts. And because of this perspective, this convergence that I'm talking about here, you can, and um, is often done, where you make the far side, which in this case is, the far side is going to be this side, you make the far side sh uh, shorter. The distances are going to be shorter. It's not going to be as wide as the near side. Now, which side is the near side? Which side is the far side? Well, what we're really asking is what is closest to us? What is closer to us? So if this is all falling back this way and this is falling back this way, then this is closer to us. This is the near side. Now, the eye spacing the idea of the five-eyed line, which is the line that it, it's a way of measuring the width of the head. The, the head is on average five eyes wide from the widest part of the cranium. But you see variation in this. Some people's eyes are, are narrower or are, 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 um, set narrower. It's called the interpupillary distance. Now, and some people's eyes are set wider. And oftentimes uh, in fashion and um, with models, the models will be chosen that have a, their eyes that are slightly further apart than the average that, that can be considered to be beautiful in some industries and in some contexts. But generally speaking here, we need to have 
this reliable symmetry. And so your eye here is her right eye needs to come over a little bit. And we need to get the sense that it's really ending higher. And if this is the corner, higher. So that's where, that's where the inner canthi are going to be. So that's one thing you could tune, you could tune up. Next is the mouth here. So, I mean, there, there's a little bit of wiggle room here. It's, it's not a, it doesn't have to be perfectly precise. And you can make expressions with your face, which are going to mess with the symmetry of the nose and of the mouth and the mobile areas, brows. But generally speaking, we want to like, we want to stick the landing here. We, we want to nail it. And even if there is asymmetry in the model's face, getting the construction right is going to look proper. It's going to look correct. It's going to look right. Um, a lot of times uh, people look at, talk about fetching uh, for portraits. I would point to uh, Holbein. When you look at Holbein, what I really want you to pay attention to is how precise this construction that I'm talking about right now is. It is incredibly precise, not incredibly realistic, but incredibly precise. The symmetries are excellent. The way that the eye is drawn, the near side eye versus the far side eye, like there's just an ultimate sort of precision there that I'd really like you to, to study. It, it'll, it'll help you. So a little bit more discipline there. If you get these things built um, with a stronger foundation, then you can be more expressive on top of that and it'll be more believable. And in a sense, you're sort of earning, you're earning the right to do that. So, okay, so the mouth, like I said, here and here, and the mouth is actually, so we, you, you gotta imagine that, like I kinda showed here as I, as I brought this line in, but the lips on the teeth are coming down and then they're pulling up and around so the lips are coming, if we've got our teeth here, the lips are coming up and around. They're, they're coming from inside the mouth and they're curving around. So you, the way you've got your shadow on there is nice, but we're not gonna get this black, um, this total black shadow and then the teeth sticking out most likely. We're not gonna get that kind of effect. So I do like that you're rounding this out but um, a little bit with the values there, I think we have to think about that a little more. But when we're thinking about the mouth, try not to think of it as, try to think of it as just a line, like I'm going along your core shadow here, and then another line, and then like, hmm, how do I fill this in? Try to imagine it a little bit more uh, anatomically. And what I mean is, try to imagine that it's it's coming from underneath the teeth. It's coming from inside, and that there are there are there are fatty deposits here. There are fatty pads in here, and sometimes there's one in the middle, and sometimes these ones are joined, and it's coming from in here, and it's folding, so it's unraveling as it comes out from the corner. And try to think like try to think of the forms of it. And it's gonna, like you want, so if the teeth are here, it's, it's, it's getting its roundness. So the, the mouth barrel, the tooth cylinder, the teeth are round. And, and you've got these nodules where the muscles are coming together, or it's very thick. If you reach into your mouth right now, or, uh, actually do it, reach into your mouth and feel around the corners of your, of your uh, mouth, it's actually thick here. So, the roundness is coming from the teeth. So you've got you've got a nice job of showing, you've done a nice job of showing the curvature of the lips, but you also have to show the curvature of the teeth and, and they need to seem like they are one in the same. So we're seeing the bottom of the lip. Why aren't we seeing the bottom plane of the teeth? Sorry, that's my coffee machine shutting down. So if we're seeing the bottom of your the lip here and it's curving up and away, it's curving up and away, then I'm gonna expect us to also be seeing the bottom planes of the teeth as well. And this is subtle, this, this, is, this is a subtlety. The features require a lot of subtlety. So you don't, you're not gonna go in there and zoom in and 
draw these things as if they're huge structures necessarily, but you need to think about it as if it was a large sculptural structure in order to get the nuances right. Because what I just said about like having um, a bottom plane to the teeth, that could just end up being a very subtle little little mark, a little shadow in how you actually depict that, but you have to think of it. And it's not gonna happen unless it's already inside your head. So again, and with the lower lip, it's turning out from the corner. And this is the long side here, and then this is the shorter side. So keep thinking about the shorter side versus the long side. Like this lip should be longer and more stretched out, and then this should be retreating more quickly. There's gonna be a difference always between the near side and the far side. Same thing with the eye, the near side and the far side eye. There's gonna be differences there. So just a little more sensitivity to that. And then, what the heck was, so with the green. And then as I was saying, talking about this, the, these lines, the structure, oh, newbie, mistake. So I'm talking about this structure. It also applies to the head. So we're going back in space here. Like this is the, this is the front of the head, whether we wanna think of that as here, as here, as here, or as a straight. There's many ways for us to conceive of how the front plane turns to the side plane. There's different ways to think about it. But regardless, if we're coming down from the brow to the ear, and we're coming down from the, the base of the nose to the ear, the ears are on the side, but the axis that connects them is going to be the same as this construction in the front. So it doesn't matter that they're on the side, we're still comparing it to the front features. It's, it's, a, it's a box. I know I'm not the first teacher to probably have pointed out that to you. But in other words, these construction lines, these construction lines, that's what's going on. So the uh, ears are gonna have to be along the same axis, and currently they are not. So this line is coming uphill more. And then if we come, if I'm just following this movement here, we're a little bit better off here. So, I mean, not ter not terrible, but what, what ends up happening is on this side, the face is sort of opening up. So if we were like, let's let's just, let me use the, uh, uh, I'm gonna do so like a perfectly straight line using the, letting the software, if it will. There we go. So if I try to make these lines a little more parallel, We realize that this ear is coming too low. So that brings me to another thing. I think this ear actually is also too small because on the far side, the ear size is not as much of a problem. It's definitely awkward. Like it looks a little bit like a bat ear or something. Um, it's an unfortunate placement and it's, um, but I think mainly what's probably happening is that because you've built your ear on this line right here, that's sort of where you've built the ear off of and The this essentially the jaw where where the jaw is terminating needs to be going back. It angles back, and so then what happens is the ear is not just st up here. The ear is actually coming down, and we should be seeing the bottom of the ear more. So there there's that. I think that maybe getting the angle wrong might have been visually um, why you made the mistake of making the ear too small. Some people do have really small ears though, but. Um, that needs to be corrected. So we need to check that. And then again, going along with this sort of, it's just a simple idea that gets us so, that gets us so far is we need to check, like let's just pick a point here. Like you have these tears are running over the form. Also the tears running over the form are showing the form. So that tear is modeling your form, right? Because the water is literally running over the surface and then what's next to it and what's next to it, they just don't agree at all. Like one problem I have is all this patchiness. You know, it looks like she, she looks like a uh, Bert from 
Mary Poppins. And there might be a reason why, you know, but uh, what was happening is it's, it's making the forms hard to understand because I can see your features and I can see um, the, the silhouettes, but I'm not getting a convincing read on the, the lines going over the form. And I've done this and I've harped on this again and again. But again, what I mean is if we were to, let's just, let's do it. Let's just see what I'm, see what I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and just, let's just paint out the features. Paint out the features. And then let's obscure the silhouette. Okay, so I've hidden your I've hidden your features here, and I know this is getting uh, ghastly a little bit. But if I were to ask you what's going on in any given space, like if we had to, if this was a mountain we had to climb, which way are the forms turning? The issue, like well, I'm just going to draw what it kind of looks like. I'm just letting my brain sort of try to figure out what this mountain looks like, what this surface looks like, and it's like. It's not clear. Maybe I'm coming up over this. Oh, and then, oh, I didn't mean to trigger that. Then there's an edge here. So the the big forms, so you're spending all this time working on the features, and then these big forms are melted, amorphous, not clear. So you need to study more of the anatomy of the head, specifically more where these cheekbones are. And we, we, we talked about we talked about these construction lines earlier, how important they are. And yet, let's look at uh, the construction lines of the features, that, the, of the of the non-features. Okay, well, where is this Where is this cheekbone here? Like, okay, it looks like this is sort of where the fatty pad maybe is ending here. And then if I come across, there's just a completely different scenario going on. Okay, I've got this sort of uh, jowling happening. If I come across, I would expect to see the same jowling there. And so we need a bilateral symmetry in every part of the face, and we need to show the form more. And so drawing from sculpture, uh, we've got planes of the head, and um, we've got the most accurate anatomy of the head 3D model on the new Masters Academy 3D area. So if you want to practice like what is the anatomy of the head, don't go to books or drawings or people's diagrams necessarily. I would start with just bring up our anatomy of the head and then study those muscles and then go and look at the, once you've studied the muscles, because that anatomy of the head is like very cleaned up, study those muscles and then go and draw the Goldfinger cadaver head 3D model that we have as part of the Russian academic course. If you go into that course and then you go to the head portion. So I want you to, your homework is going to be this and you can do all of this on the website. And, and one of it is uh, study the skull. And I think there, there's a lot of this content on our site, but um, since I really want you to kind of focus on learning the anatomy, because you show a lot of uh, sophistication, like it looks like you can handle more complicated ideas. It's just there's areas you, you've studied and you know a little more and there's areas there's you haven't. So study the skull and I, I would say, um, do the Russian academic course with Ilya and, and, and do the, the, the studies of the, of the 3D skull and turn it and then light it from different angles and then uh, study the, the muscles, which you can do with, um, again, with the uh, Ilya's course, you can do that in the Russian academic course with the Goldfinger cadaver head and you can study the, the 3D model, the uh, NMA anatomy head model. And then uh, you can also do Mark Westermo's course. Mark Westermo has a really good, um, very easy to follow. He has a really good, easy to follow uh, course that covers the head anatomy as well. So, and then, and then you're gonna study the planes. So I want you to, to get a little more anatomical knowledge and then study the planes because then you're gonna understand, and there's, and there's two versions of the planes that are on our site. Uh, there's the Vilpu, and then there's the NMA planes. One is just a little bit higher resolution than the other. 
So, so study those, draw those from different angles, draw those, those 3D models that we have for you from this angle, and it'll help you figure out, like answer some of the questions of what's happening in here. I know in, in the last demo I did, I started diagramming that anatomy and I could do that for you here. I can, I can draw the skull and, and draw the muscles and, sh and show how these attachments are working. But rather than you seeing me do it, I think you just need to go and, and put some of that work in. So that's my recommendation for you. Great job. Haven't we made such a beautiful, I think we should use this as the thumbnail. We've just created such beautiful artwork together. Okay, so here we have a really cool painting by Ramona. Um, Ramona is one of my favorite members of the New Masters Academy community right now because she's just been absolutely crushing it. Uh, her progress has been amazing. And if you follow her in the on the community pages or you follow her Instagram, you can just see like she is drawing and painting her butt off and it's showing. And a lot of what we talk about is working really well. Like I'm looking at this piece and it's hard for me to imagine that you haven't studied, just looking at it, that you haven't studied Glenn Vilpu and Mark Westermo uh, quite a bit and probably Bill Perkins too. Just seeing that, just looking at what you've done. Uh, it's, it's very three-dimensional. Um, I just like I just like the idea of the piece. It's just so interesting. Like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the culture is. I don't know what the story is, but all I know is that it's interesting and I, and I want to see what happens. So yeah, my wife, my wife and I, my wife, Johanna and I have been following Ramona's work as she's progressed. And so we're, we've, we've been sort of cheering, cheering you on. So, okay. Yeah. So much cool stuff. So the fact that we've got a light source that's coming down here and then we're getting the lighting here and you're, you're modeling that, that the frontal eminence, you're modeling the forehead for us. You're modeling the superciliary arches the glabella, you're modeling the the nose for us, you're giving us the cheekbones here and you're we're getting less light on this side of the face, more light here. Like there's there's really strong fundamentals here. The expression is interesting. It, it's, uh, but like it's always the structure that, that we can always improve on the structure. And I mean, I guess if we reach the whole bind level, uh, we'll probably be good or at some point if we can draw like grooves but even then like there's always improvements to make so uh it, it's easy from my perspective because i'm getting to draw over you've already done the hard work i get it just sort of troll you here but let's just model some of this out so one so one thing just it's just it's just jumping out at me is that the frontal eminence is looking like higher here and lower here which um is sort of swimming like there's gesture and movement i like that and uh but we but we don't want to move something that looks like like structure also this cheek to this cheek um while the lighting is makes sense uh, i'm not sure the symmetry makes sense so what i'm going to do is, is turn it upside down for a second i do this a lot with any piece i can because sometimes things can jump out at you when you turn them upside down Hopefully it's recording it upside down. It's not correcting for this somehow. But what I want to ask you now, uh, everyone watching, is what jumps out at you now? Like what what is not correct? So for me, what what I see when I when I flip it upside down is that I see that I've got this shape, and it's a little bit skewed, and then everything else is just sort of coming up like this. And it looks to me like there's a little bit too much of a, of a skew this way. It's as if I'm I'm plucking it. And lifting it this way and tweaking it. So in other words, I would expect more of the cranium and jaw around this side. But let's turn it back around and see. That, that's a really useful. You can hold a mirror. I mean, in, the, in our side size course, we show that technique of holding a mirror and looking at both your reference and your work upside down. Or even if there's no reference, just turning it upside down or looking at flipped. We can do the same thing actually. Let's 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 do that really quickly if I can, can remember how. I think it's just a matter of. There we go. Okay. And. Now that I flipped it horizontally, I'm more sure that everything here is being, it's, it's just, it's this distance here is probably too low and it's too biased to the top. And also that probably we're drifting, like these facial features are drifting a little bit too much that way. 
So let's just see what would uh what would probably need to happen for us to improve this a little bit. So it, it doesn't hurt to start with figuring out where the orientation of our head is. So if I try to figure out where this is, I'm getting a little bit of a problem here because it doesn't look like this model has a small ear. Like it doesn't look like the type of head that would have a small ear. And the reason I say that is because you got so much uh, skeletal development here and here. It's like a very masculinized head. So I wouldn't expect there to be a smaller ear on that because cartilage and the bone development, there's a relationship there. So I'm not, I'm not really, um, I'm not buying that the ear is that it should be there and should be that small. So now what I have to decide, since it seems to me like there's probably a problem in the placement of the ears, I have to decide what is the tilt of the head actually that we're going for, because that's what we're going to work towards. To me, it, it looks like we're, we're more or less level with the head, because I can't really see much of the submandibular area if I go, and I have to judge this too, because we've got this interesting hairstyle, but if we go from here, if we go from where I'm thinking the top of the head is, down the eyes are maybe a, maybe a little higher than than I would place them and it's also possible that you meant that to be the top of the head we're more or less in, in range here so I think in this case like probably the best bet would be to treat it as if we're level with the head and I mean what I'm essentially asking here is are we whether it's subtle or not are we tilting down are we seeing a little bit of the top of the head? Or are we, are we looking up at the head? And then secondarily, and this tends to be where people get into more, even more trouble, like this can be problematic, but the other thing is the tilt. So which way, which way is the head tilted? And that's more difficult. And the reason it's more difficult is you have all different kinds of uh, profiles So there's different angles that people's faces um, are going to create and other center lines that we might have are also going to have angle to them. Like this is not up and down. This is angling forward. So there's not a lot of vertical things for us to, to look at. And so it can be tricky for us to see uh, some of these tilts. But we'll treat it as if it's it's just level. So let's do that. So, okay. If we're doing this, sorry, my iPad's slipping around a little bit the way I'm, I have it set up. And then I'm noticing here from here to here. It's a little bit of an issue. So I think that the, the way the cheekbones are modeled, then it needs to be it needs to be worked out a little bit more. The orbits come together in a peak is going to be it's going to tend to be what sort of contains the frontal eminence. Now the frontal eminence, which is this form that you're drawing here, it can be separated. And so looking like the form is sort of fusing, it can fuse together. There's different shapes that uh, it'll create, but what we are looking for is we're looking for a round volume that's up here. And that round volume, because of its projection, creates a, a planar difference here where these planes are stepping back into space and this is an elevated area. So, as we start to draw, it, it, like I'll, I'll keep going here and we'll keep modeling it, it out a little bit, but you're probably gonna start to notice as we just put some of the structure in some of these problems. And so if we continue the the this line, if we're saying it's more or less equal, more or less, uh, the head is more or less level, then we're gonna expect the ear to be doing something more like that. And then the mat, the, and because the head is not tipping backwards or forwards, we're going to expect the jaw to be somewhere in here. So 
So I think we need to sort of drop some of these elements here. The point at which the cheekbones, the lowest point of the cheekbones tends to be on the same level here. And putting that in, because I don't, I don't really have room for this, because if I'm, if we're here on the outside of the eye and then we're here, there's not enough room for the, the fat and the muscle, zygomaticus major, the masseter coming off of it in the other direction, the masseter is going back this way. Um, there's not enough room for it, so that tells me that we probably need to move this out because we're going to have our masseter here and then we're going to have the fleshy areas that are wrapping around coming from here. So probably we need more face on this side. We need to drop this corner here. Another question, this is like a big thing that we have to always look for in our portraits is that are the side plane, how much of the side plane versus how much of the front plane? So usually like if we're drawing from observation, we're deciding like, is it the, and uh, Hogarth, Bern Hogarth's book deals with this. It's one of the few things I, I like about Hogarth is how he, how he talks about like the egg of the head and how it can turn and how we're seeing a different amount of the back of the head versus the front and the different amount of the ear. But we always need to be really conscious that, and we can consider in this case, the side of our uh, skull to be doing something like this. So this is the, this is a trend, this is a diagonal transitioning plane. And then this is going back and then we're gonna have the temporalis muscle in here. But if we're saying that this is the, uh, the side of the head, is this enough distance compared to this? Are these distances actually correct? Now, we're, we're kind of attuned to this. If it's off, it'll look a little funny to us and it's really hard to put our, our finger on why. So if we're doing, uh, if we're drawing from observation, what you can do is look, like just take this overall distance and try to say, okay, like if this is my halfway mark, where where is this, this side uh, plane breaking? And you can, through experience of drawing heads from observation, start to get a sense of what it should look like. We tend to make this falling back here too small. And what you're doing here, where I was saying you're pulling this all up too much this way, it's common. So just keep this in mind, because this is a point that I make and that I think it's helpful to think of it. The bottom of the cheekbone, the base of the nose, the mastoid process behind the ear, and the, and the back of the skull are all on this line. So they're all low. So it's almost like I would expect maybe to see a little more of the, of the back of the neck here and a little more of the cranium down here. And then if we take our center line, which in this case with your, with your center line, it, it, it tends to work more because your structure is working a little better than, than the case in the last drawing in, th in this particular way. And so if we're saying that and using it, we can use a, a, a rule of thumb of thirds to go from here to here to the brow to the hairline and you're more or less where you should be. That's really, that's really good. But then we've got the actual cranium. And then at some point is going to be the highest point of the cranium. It's usually halfway back on the head but it can, it can change, so it might be here. This might be the actual high point. So if we were actually measuring, if we could see the head and we were measuring the, uh, the distances, you, would, you, would, you could bring a line out like this. And this line could actually go out and space at an angle as well. So, okay. And people's heads have different shapes, you know. Europeans tend to have a corner here. And uh, it, just, it just depends. So, yeah, more... Sorry. More of a, uh, more skull in the back, more of this mass lower. I would consider giving us some of it, some of it back here as well. And then if we step down from here to the base of the nose and increase that distance again, the pit of the neck, which is looking good. And then if we step this pit, pit of the neck back in space, and we have to imagine this to try to get a sense of where where our C7 might be. And you don't have to do it, you don't have to get it on the first try. We can, we can just, we can, tr we can try this again and again. And then it's, it's sometimes good just to get a general sense of where we think, 
the neck might be inserting in terms of just like a cylinder. And then think about how, okay, the sternocleidomastoids are gonna wrap around this and come in and then it's gonna wrap around this, come in and then trapezius, which is connecting back here, is going to emerge. And it's good for you to, to actually, even, even if it, you're just showing a little bit of the shoulders to try to figure out where the clavicle is gonna be. And it's gonna be the same distance as this. So even if it's just a ballpark, just to help you. That it can help you show the, the form underneath. The, so these are the areas that I think you need to uh, focus on improving your understanding and go to the anatomy for that. I mean, just a clue is gonna be that you need to get back here with the cheekbone. And the way that like this form seems like it's coming up to the top of the ear, but no form is doing that. The form is actually heading back down this way. You can get uh, to the, your temporalis muscle that's in here can be full. And so it can create a bit of a ramping plane, but we got to correct some of these uh, distances. And also with the masseter, as the masseter ends, it's a plane change here. So good job overall, uh, keep up the good work, but start refining your knowledge of, of the skull and of these planes and with this, the same advice as in my last critique. One more little note before I move on to the next is just the mouth maybe is looking a, a little bit pinched. So, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this and this, this, is, a, this is a rough rule of thumb because there are things that can get in the way of this. But just generally speaking, just as a way to kind of get your eye to start looking, is you want to look for the, the corners of the mouth to end in alignment with the eyes. And if the face is, if you have prognathism, which is the, the lower face, I'm actually touching my head, that's why I sound funny, but the lower face projecting forward. So the more this lower, so if, if the lower part of the face is projecting forward more, then those points are going to be biasing, in this case, if this is our near side, they're going to be biasing that way because they're they're pushing forward. So it might be that, you know, they both slide from that position a little bit to the left, but the problem I'm, I'm seeing here is that, well, one is probably the eyes are a little bit too large. Yeah, I let me, let me just, let me, let me help you with this. So... These are, the distances are okay here. Your problem with the eyes is that you're not leaving room. You're running the base of the eyes into the nose. And, they, and that's not what happens because you actually have skull in here. So the eyes end and then there's a space and then you need to make your way up and over and down the other side and there's a space so you don't want to run the eyes into the, into the, 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 like the foothills. If this was a mountain, the eye doesn't run into that. So what you should, what you would probably do is, is sort of move them out a little bit, maybe like this. So in addition to the eyes running into the nose, which is a little bit, a little bit of a problem. I think that the mouth is too narrow and it's too far shifted that way. It's too far shifted that way. I think it needs to open up more and we need to think of the round forms of it. Like let's just sort of, maybe it's better if I do that here. Let's just sort of just look at it as sort of a simple round form for a minute. Just think of it like that. I think we'll find that the far side
versus the near side it's not it's not really believable how it's uh, breaking down it seems like there's I think what the problem might be um, what I mentioned about the nose is that we don't have the skeleton of the face here because the nose is too wide so I think the nose is placed sort of incorrectly on the face and so if we have like this brow structure here, and maybe the eye starts and the out eye ends, and then we're stepping down, and then the nose is coming out. It's gonna get wider here. I'm just gonna keep this really simple. I think what happens is it needs to come further back, which means the philtrum here are not going the right place. These are going like straight up, but really, if the if it's really starting here, sort of that's the center line. And if we're saying okay, maybe, and I, and I realize that the, the pupils are, are are rotated. Like this one is looking out. I seem a bit big to me as well, but. If we're here, slightly adjusting the construction of the nose and leaving room for the cheekbones on that side. Yeah. Yeah, we need more room for the maxilla. And we gotta shift some of this, some of this stuff over. All right, we have Alessandro next. This is a really nice piece. So I keep getting these. Um, like I am keep choosing these images, not on purpose, that have a similar lighting scenario. It seems like in each of my critique videos, I have at least one video that's doing that, which is light sources coming from behind. Or maybe I am just subconsciously choosing these. Light sources coming from behind. You know, we we're, in this case, we are getting the rim light. In the other situations, I was recommending the rim light. A little bit of that happening here. The light's spilling over here. So this is the first cast shadow that tells me the direction of of what the uh, of the sun, of the light source is doing that. Because this cast shadow is, is the most obvious thing that shows me that. So we're getting some direct light, which we call that a rim light. What a rim light means is that, you know, you're getting the direct light from behind so we are getting direct light in these places and the rest of this is all in shadow and what what does in shadow mean in shadow we're usually as artists when we talk about the shadow side or the light side what we mean is that we're generally dealing with a primary light source one primary light source one most important light and that light, in this case, is the sun. It can be artificial light, in which case you'll have a fall off. So as we get further, if we're going down the figure, you probably see this a lot as you go down the figure or down the portrait. You know, artists will tell you, oh, well, as you get further away from the light source, have a fall off. Well, that fall off would make sense in an artificial light situation where there's not that many photons being emitted. It doesn't make as much sense in a, in a sunlight situation, a direct sunlight, because the sun is emitting so many photons from so far away that the difference between the top of your head and the bottom of your feet in terms of what you're receiving is so negligible that you're not going to see a fall off. And so um, what, what we mean by the shadow side in the case of a sunny day like this is that what, 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 what is the direction of the sun? And so everything that is on the opposite side of that, think of the earth, right? If we have the earth and we have the sun very far away, or the moon is probably a better example. Everything on this side that is being um, occluded is the shadow side. Now, all of our painting, all of the important stuff in the painting is happening on the shadow side. So that that's an interesting compositional choice. It could have been just the photo reference you had and you didn't think about it and you just dived in, that's often the case. 
Or it could be that you intentionally are trying to set up that challenge where the foreground is darker than the background. Like the ocean is getting more direct light than most of your figure here. But that's a challenge because then we have to rely on our secondary light sources to light the actual subject matter, the portrait in this case. And so what is what are the secondary light sources? Well, it's going to be essentially the entire it's the entire sky dome so the sky is going to be bringing light in from all from all sides everything above the you know the the earth it's going to be bringing light in so the dome around the around the subject matter you're you're sort of getting even light more or less you're getting uh, light contributing from all directions and depending on the clouds depending on you know the the uh, weather conditions it's going to get you're going to get a different pattern there but we sort of think of that essentially as just you're getting light from all of the upper side and then you're getting light from the ground in this case you know this is a a girl that's sitting on the sand so the sand is going to be bouncing light back up and that's the light source that I think we should be using in this case I think we should be using the sand that is bouncing light back up so essentially once we deal with this rim light and then if we want to put a terminator in these areas and the cast shadows once we've dealt with that we are going to be i think considering the light source as coming up and it can be for the purposes of our, our of our lighting this we can we can treat it as coming from in the opposite direction as the direction of the sun so all of that i'm saying all of that because there's not enough construction and modeling of form inside here. And, and I think if you had a, a simpler strategy for, for how to approach that, this would have been a little bit easier. And so we are getting lights on the bottom of the nose, which is great, on the bottom of the lip, but it's not consistent enough. And so let me just show you a little bit um, what it means if we if we understand that. So what, this is sort of, just curious actually to explain this point because we're so used to the light source coming from above that lighting things from below, uh, if that's what we're doing, is difficult. So let's just flip this upside down for a minute because maybe it'll actually make it easier for us to understand um, how to model the light on the form from this direction. So I'm not really set up to... It's already sort of like a like a big egg. And the nice thing about that simplicity is that we can we can imagine how an egg that is being lit from this direction is going to react. Something like this. So now, since we've got a head, so then what we can do is we can, we can our shadow side can be sort of the forms that are turning over this way. It can be in how this plane changes, even be in how And so the problem here is that for most of this, we don't, we're not getting any modeling of structure in the cheeks and these other areas here. So if the nose is really turning like this, if, if the light's coming from up here on the nose, we, you, we don't get off. Um, we're not off of the hook and having to figure out the form ever. We need to, we need to work out what's happening so and then even just generally like overall So on this side, you're not going to have as much of that. So 
So let's flip this thing back around. And what we see is that we need more information. That, that, that's, that's essentially the, the issue here is that we need more form. And so instead of by adding a darkness, and I'm doing that to illustrate a point, it could be the other way around where we are just, we're adding, we're modeling a light. And that is what you are doing here under the nose. But as we model that light, we have to have an idea. Let's even get a little lighter. We have to have some idea of what the form is doing. And I don't think we're gonna get a bright there. I mean, there's, there's there are situations that could have caused that, but probably this is not gonna be up there brighter than it would be for um, some of these other planes. Whereas I do think that like the cheekbone here, it's gonna get some light. And shadows, cast shadows can work the other way too. Cast shadows can actually come up this way from a secondary reflected light source. And so even a child's head, even a baby's head is gonna have the, it's gonna have many of the same qualities that we see, uh, some of the same form qualities that we see in adults. Like babies have all of that. If you look carefully and under the right lighting conditions, they've got all, they've got jowls, they've got all of the, all of the uh, same uh, form changes that you'd expect to see in an adult. So we are lighting this more from below and then you've got your your direct light is very bright and so all of this direction that we're talking about well if the sun is catching some of this then it's gonna it's gonna override this idea so the in other words the any of the sunlight that's the direct light that's sneaking over here is going to catch and how much is, is gonna uh, catch on the form. And that's gonna be important. So separating the, the direct light from, so the lighting rules of this universe, let's say, versus the lighting rules of this universe, that's gonna be really important to making the illusion uh, work. But let's say we, we if, if we treat this cheek over here as a, as a, um, like just an egg, then it could be that we are getting getting a roundness that's happening here. And then this light is sort of this light is our is is overriding what we see. And it's here. And as you showed, it's here as well. And maybe this is a little sharper because maybe this is a cast shadow right here. And so then next to it, it's actually sharper. But we could decide, like you could always move your, your light source. You could angle it a little differently, let's say. And since this is so important to showing, to showing the uh, forms of the head, maybe you want to change the direction of this. Like we're, we're in control as the artist. It doesn't matter what our reference is doing. We actually, we have the final say here. So it's, it's, it's one way to handle it. Um, you need to get in here and you need to model more. And even though, you know, it's a child, we still want to be building out the cheekbones and, and this kind of thing. Can be like there can like I was saying there can even be like essentially like little, little 
little cast shadows on the opposite side of the reflected light. Up here, for example, maybe on the brow here, we might get some darkness or maybe. So what you need to do is Um, you need to start playing with the modeling, and it is a, it's a fun it's a fun and challenging situation that you, you're that you're in because doing all of this modeling on these soft forms, which I have to say I like I feel like you have very good taste like you're you have a nice sensitivity in the way you're modeling these shapes and these lines shows a lot of. Um, Restraint. I, I like that a lot. Like maybe for example, you'd get more, you'd get more light coming around here. But this is the sort of the situation that you find that you find yourself in is that we've got to model things from different directions in, or, in order to make them work, and it's possible also that we just need to have more of a. Maybe if I just bring this. Make it a little darker. It's possible that we just need to have more of a um, of a contrast with your with your rim light, as in everything else. And then the hair is also it, the hair is part of this. It's part of this world too. It's part of this lighting scenario too. So the hair is getting our uh, the direct the direct sunlight from here. And so, yes, it's dark, but we're going to be probably getting a much lighter value in the sides that are being exposed to that, whatever that, you know, whatever that local color is, it's gonna be lighter where it's getting sunlight. And then um, if we, let's say, let's say her hair is wet and we're getting reflection, you're gonna see that and then it's going to be darkest as it is as it's turned furthest away from our secondary light source and then as we as we get closer to our secondary, like the, the, the light that's coming from the sand or whatever, it's going to brighten up again. So this is the world that you need to be playing with in here. And there's so much, <laughs> like it's, it's a really, it's a fun problem to have. It's a fun scenario to have just just looking at it and just trying to critique you and help you makes me want to like dive in and help figure out this problem because it's uh it's actually really exciting so yeah um again it comes down to construction we need more construction we need to model these forms and just because it's soft lighting or that we're in the shadow side it doesn't get us off of, out of that obligation in fact it makes that obligation more challenging more difficult okay Eric, so I have to apologize. I did do a critique of your drawing and I kind of spent a lot of time on it, but this was late last night and what ended up happening was your, uh, well, my iPad actually died on me <laughs> during the recording and so I lost the video, but I do have the playback from uh, Procreate. So um, I'm going to play that back and just try to kind of hit on some of the things that I talked about. So first of all, thank you for submitting uh, so much work. The drawings were beautiful. And also the um, the work that you submitted uh, more recently, I think you did this today, uh, the time I'm recording this, of the paintings are just fantastic. So I want to talk a little bit about your portrait because um, I think the lessons here are useful for everybody, but they also apply to um, even the more advanced work that you've done. So I, I like the uh, personality of this piece. I like the warmth of it. I, I think the rendering, the drawing technique is very good. Overall, I, I think it's beautifully done. Um, what is interesting to me about it compositionally is that you've got this uh, newsboy hat on, 
and we're dropping a, a shadow off of the of the hat onto the face, and that is covering one of the eyes and leaving the other one uh, in the light. And that's just interesting, you know, just thematically. Obviously, just saying that out loud, I'm sure you can, and I'm sure you did think of, of what that might mean. Maybe it means there's, you know, we have a, a side of us that's hidden and a side of us that is shown to the world. We have a shadow side and we have a side in the light. Um, it's, it's really interesting. So I played with that idea a little bit as I was drawing over this, and I even tried kind of pushing it more dramatically and sort of dropping that shadow like across the entire face. Because one thing I noticed is I, I like that the shadow is covering one of the eyes, but the the where that cast shadow ends was was vague. And so the uh, the problem I have with it is that it's sort of interfering, like it needs to be clean and we need to see where that's ending, wherever the shadow is ending. So where it starts is very obvious, but then as it sort of moves across these complicated forms and there's, it doesn't have a sharp edge, it's hard to see. And so I would like to have a little more clarity in, in that cast shadow. So you'll see as I, as I, as I go through the playthrough here in a minute um, that I show that. So the, the overall process of what I did is I started just by sort of diagramming structure and it's always structure. It's what we're always talking about. So we talked about in the last videos, um, that's what I really want to stress. And if, uh, you know, if my students learn anything from me, um, it's what I really push is the three dimensional volumes. And so there is a, a lot of um, three dimensional form happening here, but by working out the structures even more, we start to, like, that's how we actually notice things that are off that we wouldn't have noticed and allows us to take the rendering a little bit farther, to a little bit further and to, and to take the overall um, the project a little further. So I'm going to go ahead and start the playback here. So beginning the playback first, I'm, I'm sort of just diagramming overall like what I find interesting about it and I like it's it's your it's your lighting design and how you've how you've composed it just spatially is really interesting so then I look at the eyes later I'm going to sort of decide that your eyes are probably a little bit large which might have been intentional as you see there I drew the little newsboy cap and I'm trying to show that you know it need, the brim needs to come from one side and because we have bilateral symmetry it needs to connect on the other side I start to work out a little more specifically the forms and, and building into the areas that are more subtle and, and just checking to see if everything seems like it's three-dimensionally in the right place. Um, I start to see issues and one of them is that, you know, there's not a, the, where the eyes are versus the chin, there's not enough room up there for the head. So I sort of just stretch that up a little bit. And then obeying, like, like kind of the most interesting thing about the design is this cash shadow coming off the brim. So we need to reinforce that in other places as well. And so as we start to take that through the piece and, and use that, and here I'm using sort of your sideburns to kind of chisel away uh, the form there. This is what I'm assuming that yeah, you were doing as well. And then so what, what eventually I realized is that I think the face portion is too large. And so I end up actually uh, shrinking it down. And in this case, I actually shrunk the entire head just because I thought it was more interesting maybe if you've got more voluminous um, uh, coat on, just a larger coat. And it, I, and I, I, I talked a little bit about rotating the head in such a way to get to get um, more of an impact. And so that's what I've done here. And I'm just sort of just I'm just showing you an idea of where to take it. Obviously, I'm not looking at you, and I don't know the actual original intention here. But then uh, I was talking about maybe adding some some brighter lights whether those are highlights or whether it's local color or whatever, it could give a bigger range to the piece and let you play more because you're working so much in these dark values and you're starting with a toned paper. So it might be interesting to see what you can pull off if you actually push it a little further. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's what happened there.